Hello and welcome to another edition of Anderson County Conversation. Folks, we got another good show lined up for you today. We want you to sit back, relax. Be sure you call all your family and friends and tell them we're on air. We are at the Oak Ridge History Museum right here in Oak Ridge, and we are with a man that knows so much about Oak Ridge and a good friend of mine. And we're and I'm going to introduce him to you now, Mr. Don Honeycutt. Welcome to the show, Don. Well, thank you for having me, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a native Oak Ridge, born in September 1944, and I've been here all my life. And uh, I acquired the love for Oak Ridge history many years ago, and I had the pleasure of marrying Ed Westcott, the official photographer. Uh, his daughter, that is, right. not him. He was the official photographer for the Manhattan Project here. So with that, in I gained more knowledge from his photographs and talking to him as well. So that's kind of how I got involved in Oak Ridge history. I want you to talk about uh, Mr. Westcott. Uh, of course, he passed away a couple, I guess a couple years ago. It was last year. Last year. And uh, talk about how he came to Oak Ridge to do the photography and just a little bit about Mr. Westcott. Well, he grew up in uh, Chattanooga and lived there a short time, and then his family, uh, he had a brother named Hugh, they moved to Nashville. He got interested in photography, and uh, his father bought him a Froth Derby camera for Christmas one year. He started taking photographs in a, uh, of the neighborhood and so forth, and then he acquired a pie wagon, which used to go around horse pull wagon, he converted that into a dark room and he started processing a film for his mother and the neighbors. And then he attended two art studios in Nashville and learned how to mix chemicals for developing film and more technical aspects of being a photographer. And he got a job later with the Corps of Engineers in Nashville as a chief photographer. Mm -hmm. And he made different uh, photographs for the projects for the Corps of Engineers. One in particular is he photographed the site in Crossville, Tennessee, of a prisoner of war camp, or several across the mm -hmm. uh, state of Tennessee. They came in to him and asked him, uh, would he like an assignment in Knoxville? He said, sure, what would I be doing? He said, we can't tell you. So he was 20 years old at the time, and he arrived in Knoxville uh, in December of 1942. And um, his job was to take um, photographs of building the uh, four nuclear plants and the daily life in the city of Oak Ridge. Now I say four nuclear plants, that was Y-12, X-10, uh, K-25, and S-50. You don't hear much about the S-50 process. No, I, I'm not real familiar. What was S-50? Talk about that a little well, bit. Well, S-50 was another way of uh, separating U-235 and U-238 isotopes by a high-pressure steam process that the Navy designed. Mm -hmm. It came online late, and uh, they had a lot of issues with it, and uh, General Groves decided to shut it down because the K-25 gaseous diffusion type process was coming online and he didn't feel like that was needed anymore, so it didn't last very long. You know, something people ask me about it, I, I'm a technical end, I don't know a lot about it, uh, but I know that they started out doing the electromagnetic process for separation at Y-12. Uh, how, how long did they actually do that before K-25 came along? Do you know the answer to that? Well, about 1940, I think in mid-43, the plant came online, Y-12, and it worked 24-7 right. around the clock, and they had like somewhere 1,200 or so, approximately somewhere in that range, or maybe more, of calutrons, alpha and beta right. calutrons scattered throughout the Y-12 facility. And it took a lot of processing uh, over and over and over to get very small amounts of uranium. It went through the alpha calutron at a certain enrichment. They took it out and put it through the beta calutron and enriched it to about 90-92% right. uranium. Uh, bomb grade bomb uranium. Granium, uranium. And then the uh, gaseous diffusion process came on, which entirely was a different process of separating the elements. 
and they uh, used some of the feed work from K-25 and produced the amount of uranium they needed to build the little boy, the first right. bomb they dropped on Japan. And your uh, uh, other bomb that dropped, I think it was a plutonium, is that correct? It had a plutonium core called the Fat Man, and uh, it had uranium in as well, but it was a different type core, and that was uh, the first and only atomic bomb exploded was at the Trinity site in Amagurdo, New Mexico, and it was called the Gadget, and that had a plutonium base to it, and it was on a tower, and they exploded it. Whereas the little boy, they didn't even do a test. They wasn't sure right. that it worked, but it was. It did, obviously. It had a barrel, a gun barrel, off a ship that they had a piece of enriched uranium in one end and another larger piece in the other. High explosive sent that smaller piece down the barrel, and it, when it collided with the larger piece of enriched uranium, it went critical. And both of these weapons was detonated as airburst. They were armed on the way to the targets in the planes. Uh, now, I think that was the plutonium was Hanford, Washington. Is that correct? Were they yes, Hanford, Washington was built. The B reactors out there to produce plutonium for that particular weapon. And then later, plutonium was used in other types of weapons as well. Another question that many people ask me uh, is why they chose to use two different bombs, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, what was the reason they didn't use, say, two plutonium or two uranium? Did they not know the effects completely on those or what? Well, I, I don't know exactly, but my guess is that the first bomb was a lesser design. It was a little more simpler design to, to do the job. And then they, as scientists uh, do their work, they are always looking for something new. And I presume this plutonium came on the scene that it was a more potent type bomb. And the design made it uh, more useful, I guess. I'm, I, I really don't know. I've never read anything that uh, indicates one sure. way or the other. They're both, they both were successful. And um, I guess it was just because advanced, the, the scientists had mm -hmm. some advanced knowledge and that's the reason they built the other one. I want to talk to you also, uh, people watching, about the different sites that we had during the time uh, the Manhattan Project started. Uh, I think uh, some, in, I think they were working on the University of Chicago, but I mean, there's many different sites throughout. Uh, name some of the places that were the... That well, were. Stag Field, which was in Chicago on the university site, is where they first stacked up the uh, enriched material to, to, to almost go critical, or it maybe it did, but anyway, that's where they designed and got the design to build the bomb, I guess you might say. Oak Ridge, uh, they wanted to, uh, the government was looking for a area that was not very well populated, uh, had uh, electrical power, water, um, not uh, close to a big city, and some rolling hills. Mm -hmm. So they looked at the side in California and they said, no, this is too close to the coast, which means it's too close to Japan or be too close to any enemy evasion mm -hmm. or whatever. And uh, another place, I believe, up somewhere in Ohio was looked at, but then they came to this area, and it was perfect. TVA Norris Dam had just been built in 1939, so we had the power. The Clinch River was the water. Not very populated, maybe 10,000 families scattered out all over the place here or so. And then Knoxville was the biggest town, which it wasn't anywhere the size it is today. And we had the rolling valleys and the hills. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason. Secluded, kind of, yeah. Oak Ridge was selected. In uh, many different sites that they have, of course, you hear about Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, is that where most of your scientists were working in, in, in that area? Uh, and then I guess there's, you know, of course, later on, uh, Paducah and Portsmouth, Ohio, they were feeder plants, I think, to K25. But talk a little bit about. Uh, about how that connected on uh, first with the uh, uh, Los Alamos. Well, Los Alamos was the base for the scientists and where they did all their research at the boys' ranch up on top of the, uh, I, can't, I guess they call it the mountain out there. I've been there. 
Their mountains is nothing like our mountains, but they call them mountains. Mm -hmm. Beautiful country, very well isolated. There wasn't anything up there besides this boy's ranch. Mm -hmm. And they created a small camp fenced in with security like they did Oak Ridge and Hanford. And the scientists lived there and their families lived there as well. So they developed the concept of the bomb and that's where they did their experiments. And they were working, uh, General Glo Groves would have been work going there, coming here, and he was going in between places, wasn't he? Well, General Groves was everywhere. He was even dealing with, with the UK on the other side of the ocean, as well as in Canada with some uranium. But Oak Ridge Operations was actually ran by Colonel Kenneth Nichols. Okay. Groves was in charge of the Manhattan Project solely. So Colonel Nichols, or Kenneth Nichols, was in charge of Oak Ridge. And, and he doesn't get the credit that he should get. He did a lot for the project here. He was the one that went to the U.S. Treasury to borrow silver to make the, mm -hmm. the electromagnetic process at Y-12. And by the way, we returned 99 points three or four percent of that silver back to the U.S. Treasury. So there was very, very little. It was just a loan loan. to us, right? Really. That's right, because copper was normally what you'd build magnets with, the windings, but copper was used in the uh, making of uh, shells in the bomb effort, so there was a shortage for copper. So that's why he went to the U.S. Treasury and borrowed that uh, silver. It was a kind of a funny story, which Sometime we'll go into that. Mm -hmm. You know, Don, one of the things that's unique about Oak Ridge and the history of Oak Ridge is, especially when I went to school and you went to school in Oak Ridge, is the fact that all of our mothers and fathers were from other areas of the country. And we, we kind of mixed. And I know in our classroom, we said, well, where's your mother from? They're from Virginia. You're from Mississippi. You're from Alabama, Pennsylvania. And it was just a... That's not necessarily true today because Oak Ridge is established and people grew up here. But at that time, we kind of were very unique in that situation, wasn't we? Yes. Um, it didn't matter who your neighbors were. You could be a neighbor of Weinberg or, or anybody else that was in the know or before Weinberg was uh, other people here. Everybody blended together. All types of walks of life people came here from different parts of the United States. Actually, they sent people out to the major universities to recruit scientists and physicists and people of the upper knowledge scale, let's say. Also, they sent people across the United States to attract people to come in and be all types of labor type workers, brick masons and janitors and even the maids and you name it, they brought them in here and they would say, we got a job for you. Well, where is it? We can't tell you. And they moved here and they came here on faith that they had a job and there was uh, something for them to do. And you got to remember, it was not long after the Depression this all started. So people were starving, looking for work, and they came here and made more money than they did wherever they came from. But in the summer of 1945, we had 75,000 people here. 82,000 if you added the workforce. And that's a lot of people to live here in this small 95,000 acres, which wasn't all the town area. That was the amount of acres that they purchased. And people lived in all types of different housing. And that's what this museum is all about is it shows and tells the daily life of the people of the Manhattan Project that came here. And if I may say, the reason this museum came into existence, when the American Museum of Science and Energy decided that, or DOE decided, that they were going to move and they were going to change their theme of their museum, which wasn't going to include the daily life of the Manhattan Project. A group of us here of Oak Ridge Heritage and Preservation Association who owns this building decided why don't we make a museum and there was a board of uh, museum uh, people on the board and 
Some of these exhibits in the museum are privately owned on loan and some have been made and we're in the process now of putting museums, uh, um, museum exhibits in these empty showcases throughout and the Ed Westcott Gallery is also in the process now of being uh, developed. So we've got a lot of things in the future that uh, we've got to do. All, unfortunately the virus set in and, and we're closed and we're not sure when we'll be open again. But we opened the museum uh, officially in March of last year and there was no charge in the beginning and then we decided we needed to charge at least five dollars right. a person and a reduced fee for children of certain ages. And people has been very receptive of the museum. We've had people all over the United States and some foreign countries come through and they're just in awe of what they see. They can't hardly believe that that number of people lived here and what took place here. And we could sit here all day and talk about Oak Ridge itself and what transpired because there's so much that hasn't been told and there's so much that has been told. But the individual stories of the people that came here as young adults or came here with their parents as young children or was born here like I was and grew up here, it's just a phenomenal situation. We were a gated community and if you were 14 or older, you had to have an ID badge. And the reason for that was so you could get back in the gate if you left. Now, if your parent or parents worked at one of the facilities, obviously they had a badge. Say your father worked at Y12, he'd have a badge. Your mother was a housewife and you had two or three kids and they met the age limit, they had to have an ID badge. So right. when they left, they would come back in through the gates and there were seven gates that controlled the entry to the to the uh, reservation, and they'd show that badge and they could get in. Now, if you had someone who wanted to come to visit you, you would go down to a certain place and arrange for a pass, and you'd tell them what gate to show up at. Mainly it was at Elsa Gate on the east end of the turnpike. A lot of guys would tell their mother-in-laws that I can't get you in here. Can't get them in there. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. that's kind of a standing joke, but I'm sure some of them did. And I think it was about two weeks you could stay and you had to leave. But we as kids growing up here, we didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. It was just, uh, just a great place. There was so many kids in the neighborhood to play with. Uh, there was anything and everything here. You know, I hear, Don, so many. I talk to people that are older than I am. Of course, I'm a native Oak Ridger and grew up here. Uh, of course, the gates were gone when I came here. But, uh, you know, something we want to touch on is every... Every school had a playground during the summer run by the city of Oak Ridge and gave all the kids. We just enjoyed that so much. And uh, one of my fellow friends, and you know him, David Fitzpatrick, uh, he described Oak Ridge as a utopia. He said it, it was just a, a place that offered so much to the young people. And uh, he said, I don't think that you could find a better place to grow up in. And I agree with that. Well, this is very true. Uh, General Groves said that um, he didn't want the people working and sleeping all their time here. That he wanted them to have some recreational activities, which we they did. They had horseback riding, archery, bowling, uh, even had a golf driving range over next uh, across from uh, Weigel's uh, mm -hmm. farm store. Uh, also, uh, they had softball baseball, horseshoes, just about any recreation activity, uh, roller hockey at the skating rink and skating for the people, swimming pool over here. We had the largest outdoor mm -hmm. rain fed swimming pool in the eastern United States that held 2.1 million gallons of water and it was on a one and a half acres. Still in operation today and that water is so cold mm -hmm. over there. And also, um, let me go back and talk about this building a minute. This was the Midtown Community Center building, one of the original buildings that was opened in February 1945, and it served the area uh, where the high school lives as trailer camp number one, and the Civic Center was number two, and the crossover Pollard Auditorium was three and four and five. This whole area had trailers and hutments, and the people could come here and do what it's named like community activities, card playing or 
shuffleboard or whatever it is they had in here at this time. And then later on, the city acquired the building, obviously, as they acquired the whole city. Mm -hmm. And it was turned into the Wildcat Den, the big room in the other end of the building. And a man by the name of Shep Lauder was here, and he came in the early days, and he worked for the Health and Welfare, Welfare Office and the Recreation Department. So he was kind of the daddy that you had to be a high schooler, and you had to have a pass, a little card, and a certain age to get in. If you were too young, he would tell you you had to leave. And they had ping pong, pool table, jukebox, shuffle board on the floor. Dances? And that, oh, have... yes. Every Friday, generally, or Saturday night. And this was just one of several rec halls, or community centers, they call it. But there was rec halls scattered at all your major shopping centers for people to come. The average age was about 24 years That's old. That's what I want to know. What is the average age for that, that people live here? 24, 25 years old. And there was like two women to every man. And the men were in the military and the ones that was here either couldn't go to the military or they was essential to the job. And we had a military police force that guarded the city as well as a special engineering detachment unit here that, that worked. So there was a lot of military people here. Actually, it was like a military base behind a fence, but yet it was a city. Nobody knew what was going on in here. The surrounding neighbors, uh, Clinton, Knoxville, and Harriman, all, they had speculations of what was happening. Two ladies was talking and says, I know exactly what they're making out there at Y-12. She says, what? <laughs> she said, toilet paper. She says, well, how do you know that? That's because all, that's all my husband brings home in his lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> so you you get all kinds of stories, uh, yeah. you know. One guy says a lot of things go in Oak Ridge, but nothing comes out, and that was true. Yeah. And the people in Knox County and the surrounding areas said those Oak Ridges got everything out there. We're having a hard time getting anything. Oh, they get whatever they want. Well, it was true because this was a government-ran facility, and there was no limit on the money. Well, Don, I noticed, you know, uh, Elm Grove down there where the school is. There was community stores. There was one that burnt down at Pine Valley, just like it. There was one at uh, uh, East Village, and there's also one up on the Outer Drive. And I noticed those three buildings. They said had com they were community stores, and they had like little barber shops in them and stuff, different things. Uh, is that what they wanted, to like a school and a community store where people didn't have as many cars there and they could kind of walk to those stores? And Merle Skidmore and Owens laid out the city and they did a fantastic job. Uh, it was laid out after the, one of the guys' city that he lived in. They wanted to have walking distance shopping centers, like M. Grove Shopping Center had, like you said, a barber shop, beauty shop, grocery store, and a uh, drug store mm -hmm. and each one of those had a fire department a one engine fire department and uh, Elm Grove uh, well, later Pine on, Valley yeah, later on that Drive. turned into I remember seeing the it's higher on one end that must have been for the fire truck at Elm Grove because that turned in when I was a kid to Kelso's well Elm Grove was just a, a same level uh, down in West Village the fire department was set kind of down on the end and down at um, Jefferson Shopping Center, the building that's on the end of where Jack Green owns uh, the um, uh, Jefferson Center, down. Jefferson uh, compound mm -hmm. and the restaurant, the brick building on the right, if you're looking at the front of it, is part of the original fire department. Uh -huh. Now Jefferson and at Townsite were the only two fire departments had living quarters where they'd stay around the clock. The other ones, uh, they would just stay there a certain time right. and, and swap around. So each, uh, each shopping area, Grove Center up here was the second largest. Town mm -hmm. site was this, the first. Now we call it town site. That's what my mother used to call it before it was named Jackson Square. It was town site one, which was built where the square is, and mm -hmm. town site two where Big Ed's Pizza, that end. Later it became known as Jackson Square, and it was named after Jackson's Andrew Jackson, and there's a Jackson Square in New Orleans as well. I remember asking Mr. Westcott, uh, how did, where did they get the name Jackson Square? He said, President Jackson, and he grinned, and I thought, well, he was kidding me, because he had a great sense of humor, and you, you had to sometimes 
take his yeah. sense of humor, whether it was true or not. You, you know? know, see, it's funny how you think of things. I, you, you think, and you'll know what I'm talking about, because uh, Mr. Jackson ran the hardware, I mean, hardware store, Jackson Hardware, on the corner there. It used to be, I think it was a grocery store before then. But I remember thinking, I didn't ask anybody as a kid, I said, well, I guess this was named after Mr. Jackson. <laughs> well, I thought that, I'll you know. I'll tell you something. There was a guy named Leroy Jackson that worked here for the military, and um, Jim McGann Jr. asked him one time, "Did it, was it named after He said, no. Now, the Jackson you're talking, Charlie Jackson, Charlie Jackson first yeah. started out down here at Middletown across the street. I he had a he hardware. Did. Yeah. Then he moved at the end of the Central Cafeteria. Sure did. I've seen pictures. Uh, and then he moved on up in the square. And that was the community store number one that was occupied there before he moved there. So Jackson Square had all the necessary stores, drugstore, beauty shop, clothing shop, shoe shop, bank, uh, jewelry stores, Victory Beauty Shop, uh, Sutton's Barber Shop. There's one, there's one Don I want to talk about because it had already left when I was a kid. And I never knew this until I talked to people that grew up 10 years before me. I want you to talk about Taft Moody Ice Cream Parlor. <laughs> well, on the corner was Williams Drug Store and next to it was Taft Moody's uh, Ice Cream. It was a place you walk in and had a counter uh, on the right down through there that you could sit on a stool and get sodas and milkshakes and things like that and an ice cream. Yeah. And um, it, it was there quite a while. Uh, matter of fact, we have some pictures. They had an explosion downstairs. A gas bottle, uh, I'm not sure what was in it, exploded and a man got hurt. And we've got pictures and Mr. Uh -huh. Westcott made pictures of everything. You wouldn't believe the photographs of various subjects that we have, probably three to 4,000 images. But anyway, Taft Moody Ice Cream was there. I'm not sure when they closed, but after that, there was a malt shop. In 1955, uh, Mr. McMahon Sr., Jim McMahon Sr., used to work for Hoskins Drug Store, which is down where Big Ed's Service Drug Store, yeah, which is Hoskins in yeah. Clinton, and they had some others. He bought that uh, uh, Williams Drug Store because they moved downtown to the new area. About Shopping 55, Center. yeah. Mm -hmm. And... He turned that, he had the, a little malt shop in there, and then he closed that and expanded the drugstore to the size that Dean's Restaurant is today. So that's the story on Taft Moody Ice What is funny about that, Don, uh, uh, is I've seen some pictures uh, of that. And, of course, in 63, we moved up on Michigan Avenue, and I remember Mr. McMahon had a little restaurant in there for a year or so in that same spot, but I never knew... It was an ice cream place, but this is a, a kind of a neat thing that uh, the picture that he had taken of, of Taft Moody ice cream, when Dean was taking all the wall and the false ceiling out, he pulled that off and we could see where that stack behind the grill, you could see up in the ceiling where that same spot, it, that's what it had been all those years. So stuff like that's kind of neat to me. And another thing that I remember being inquisitive as a kid, as I was driving my bicycle in Jackson Square, is looking down through the steps in the middle there, used to be an, a neon sign, and all it said was bowling on it. But it was burnt out, it was kind of old black looking sign, and that would have been in the early 60s. And years later, I asked somebody, I said, was there a bowling alley down there? And of course, People like you used to talk about Central Bowling Alley. I think that's neat. Well, Central Bowling Alley um, is kind of stuck in the back of where the soup kitchen is today used to be the TNC Cafe or cafeteria. And um, then in the back, if you come down the steps, you're Irma Spray Garden, if you're looking at Irma Spray Garden, there's concrete steps on the right and left. On the right, if you came down and you look, there's a door that goes beside the steps. That was the entrance to the central bowling alley. And they call it bowling alley in those days. Yeah. Today we call it bowling lanes. I think it had um, eight lanes in there. I can't remember. And um, I remember one day after school, Jefferson... Uh, myself and a friend of mine, we stopped in there and set pins. 
And the first thing they told us was, when you get back there, do not send the ball back to those guys or they'll throw it while you're down in the pit cleaning the pins out. So you'd, you'd put your pins up and put them in the holder and then you give them the ball and you get up and sit behind the, the pit and those pins would fly up out of there. And you had to watch what you were doing or one of them would hit you. But that's what, uh, and that place ran for quite a while. It was in operation in the uh, 60s, early 60s when I was still in high school. And uh, Carl Sanders was a manager of it I at heard one that. time. Now, Lynn Hart was the manager of the bowling lanes at the sports center. There was a building going east from where the Civic Center is. It sits it would sit right across towards where Advanced Auto Parts is, and that road wasn't there. And that was the military sports center. Uh -huh. He ran that bowling center, and it was for other public as well yeah. as the military. And then we had the... Uh, of course, the one at Grove Center. Grove now. Center. Uh, Roscoe and Amanda Stevens managed that for many years, as well as the uh, Oak Terrace Restaurant, where you could get those yeah. nice homemade cooked biscuits they bring out on the tray about this big piled up honey on the table, it was delicious. Plus they had a feature where you could sit in the booth and eat and watch people bowl. And they had uh, 12 lanes, I believe They're talking it was. about their famous Little Adam, what it was. Well, the Little Adam was a hot roast beef sandwich. And they had a room probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe eight by 10 feet in the back that you could go in there. And as teenagers, there was a group of us, we'd go in there and sit at that table, you know, and act like we were yeah. big shots and order that Little Adam sandwich. It was a hot roast beef sandwich with mashed potatoes, and it was it was delicious. That's what all the when I got there, you had some of the same coaches, and that's where they'd go eat lunch sometimes, and they would talk about how much they enjoyed the hot biscuits and honey and stuff and everything. But you had what gets me is we were thinking the other day just how many counters there was, even when downtown shopping center opened up. You had your McCroys, your Woolworth. You had your uh, Coles, which was Revco had one. You had Walgreens had a counter. And then you had all these shopping centers that had counter service drugs. There was just counters everywhere, wasn't there? Oh, yes. I, uh, where Big Ed's Pizza is today was service drug. And I, as I said before, it's running by Hoskins. If you turn the lights on in there, you'd see exactly what it used to look like. The floor is the same. The ceiling hadn't been painted. It's just dimly lit. The booths on the left is original booths that sit parallel to their ovens. And there was a lady that worked behind the counter named Jessie. Oh, she yeah. was a little petite lady. And she would walk up Georgia Avenue and lived up off of Outer Drive. And I remember sometimes the postman in the neighborhood would pick her up and take her home. But she, was, she ran the grill. And <laughs> there was an individual, Cletus Bradshaw, that lived down the street and he used to come up and hang out there and he would go in and sometimes on Friday night Cletus he'd have maybe one or two too many and he decided he'd want a, uh, a, a uh, sandwich and he would uh, tell Jesse he said I want a, a steak sandwich damn it she said now Cletus, you're going to cuss in here. You're not going to get any food. I'm going to run you out of here. I never, I never will forget that. He was just a good old boy. He, he meant no harm. You, you know what's, and, what's so funny about that is, is we grew up on Tucker, and that's where the Bradshaws lived. But now I graduated in the early 70s, brothers in the late 60s. But Cletus was still hanging on that pole out there, even by the time I got there. So, you know, uh, and I tell people this. If you had to pick one place, service drug was one of the neatest places there is. I would get Jessie to fix me a little bowl of her special chili and a cherry smash and a grilled cheese sandwich. But when I was in junior high, that's when it closed up and that's when Big Ed's came and we really didn't want Big Ed's to come because that was such a good good drugstore encounter down there. That was, I would say in my time, now I don't know about going back, uh, people say M. Grove was real good, Mr. McKinley's and Woodland, different places. Uh, but in my growing up, it would be hard to beat service drugstore. Well, I used to live out uh, next to uh, uh, 
uh, Elm Grove when I first got married in the in the uh, drugstore was still in operation. They did make mighty good malts in there. Yeah. But um, yes, you know Big Ed's came from uh, down Huntsville. Huntsville they had a yeah. Big Ed. Matter of fact, there is a Big Ed's Pizza in Huntsville. Sure is. But he came here, I think, in '76 and opened. '70 opening '70 was 70. 70. Mm -hmm. it okay. But uh, yes, uh, even down at Jefferson, they had uh, Hoskins ran that drugstore as well. They had three drugstores here in town. They had they, from what I understand, his name was Dudley Hoskins. His daughter's named after him. That's still open. But they had drugstores went La Follette, Lake City, Oak Ridge. They they had a string of of uh, drugstores, didn't they? It's sort of like. Martin's Funeral Home. Now, Martin started out as an ambulance service in 1949, and uh, I believe it was Cox and Barry, don't hold me, that had a the first funeral home in town, and it was sitting behind the Snow White Drive-In mm -hmm. where Abbott Laboratories came for a short time. And then Martin built the building where it is today, and that was a one-story building, and I remember watching them build the up above the upper section and uh, he had a son and a daughter. Larry was a year younger than I was and we used to run around a little bit. But that's how he got started and uh, but he wasn't the first funeral home. Matter of fact when someone died that uh, they had to come to probably Clinton or Oliver Springs mm -hmm. funeral homes to claim the bodies because the secrecy, and let me go back and say, there was three things in my opinion that made this Manhattan Project go. One, the design of the separation plants here that did the separation of the isotopes. Secrecy and the dedication of the workers. When you were hired in, you were told you don't talk about your job to anyone. If you and I were working next to each other, we didn't talk about our jobs because they was afraid of losing their jobs. And today you couldn't do that. You can't do anything now. I mean, we got these cell phones and as soon as somebody dies, it's on Facebook before they have to put it in the newspaper anymore. But those are the three things I think was important. And the dedication of the people it was just phenomenal because this country was at war and we had something to work forward to and the people wanted to get the war over. There was a satellite community at K-25 called Happy Valley that the construction workers and their families lived there at Bill K-25. Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, lived there mm -hmm. for a short period of time before he went to Regis Restaurant in Knoxville and then went on to Wendy's uh, restaurant. And I heard that Colonel Sanders was a manager of one of the cafeterias here. He was. Colleen Black came here with her mother and her sister and lived in Happy Valley. And uh, the father was in Nashville staying behind working. And, and she wanted to come here and do something for the war effort because they had a brother that was in the war. And the sooner they got it over with, the sooner he'd get him home. And Colleen met a guy by the name uh, Clifford Black, and they called him Blackie and fell in love and they got married and they stayed here and raised a family and their kids are still here and Colleen's sister is still here as well. So a lot of the people that came here in those days, a funny story about the women that came with their husbands, you know, when they were young and they came here and all this construction going on and houses were being built overnight and the kids would go to school and come home and they'd be lost because houses were built so fast. They'd say, why did you bring to me the, to this God-forsaken place? And if you look behind us, this picture down here has got all this mud everywhere and everything going on because they ended up dying here and they're buried in the cemetery. They stayed. Once the mud of Oak Creek gets in your blood, you it don't ever leave. Don't yeah. uh, Don, here's something I want you to do because I think it's one, uh, you know, you're what a... a early 60s graduate of Oak Ridge High School. I know that. I don't know what year exactly, but I know you are. 62. Talk about a typical day in Oak Ridge growing up, maybe in your high school years. I've seen pictures of you parking your Cushman motorcycle up at Jefferson uh, Junior High School. I, and, uh, uh, 
just talk about in the summer, what would you do? And I know we got the playgrounds, but what would be a typical day for you during the summer with your friends? Well, I first lived in a one bedroom flat top in the East End and, and then moved to a two bedroom flat top off of West Maiden Lane. And then we had to leave and move to Woodland, which was developed, started in 1949. And we moved there right at school year of 50. Woodland was a new subdivision and there was kids, I mean, everywhere. So typical day was play like kids do, kick the can, marbles, bicycling, uh, just various games, Red Rover, Red Rover, send him over or send her over, you know, and all those type games. Uh, so you didn't have any problems finding people to play with the things to do. And then we go, of course, if you live in Woodland, the Skyway Drive-In was right across the street. It wasn't uncommon to walk over there and see the movie. Um, How then, about your, uh, did they have the playgrounds at that time going on at the different schools? Not, not that I remember. They may have, but I didn't attend anything. When school was out, I didn't want to go back to yeah. school. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I mean, Shep Lauder had a baseball uh clinic that was right across the street there at the old Carl Yearwood Park and a bunch of us kids go down there and they teach us how to play baseball you know how to slide how to hit and all that I've got pictures of us in that um, the swimming pool like I said was another activity place did you a spend lot a lot of, of time at the pool uh, yes as I got to be closer to a uh, 10 to a teenager I did I was afraid of water I didn't much like it then I taught myself how to swim and and so forth and it was a nice place together plus the bowling alleys and the skating rink. I lived on the east end of Oak Ridge and the skating rink was on the west end of Oak Ridge and we'd go down there and these guys that lived on the west end they knew how to skate. I remember there's one guy he was probably he was kind of short he had this black hair and he had his hair back like what we call duck tails yeah. in those days look like Fender it's going to fit seven Chevrolet and he carried a comb in his back pocket, and he had a white T-shirt and a pair of jeans on. The cuff was rolled up, but he could skate backwards, sideways. And when uh, I'd skate, I'd go around through there stumbling around, you know, and finally could go around one direction, never could skate backwards. And Mr. Morrow ran the skating rink, and he'd play the organ. And then he'd say, couples, all couples on the floor. Well, that's when old Don here got off the floor. I couldn't hardly <laughs> skate by myself, much less the girl. Yeah. And I asked the girl to, to skate at 10 or 11 years old. No, not me. Stay over the corner. But there. I sure did watch this one kid. I don't know who he was. I've talked to people before and it seemed like somebody that used to go down there and knew who he was. But there were several of them that could really skate. So that was another thing that we did. Um, but just about anything you want. The movie theaters or oh, the in, and and uh, would you indoor uh, theaters. normally go in eat, and go back out and play, I'm sure, and not even and until it got dark, and you'd probably go in in summertime. Well, in the summertime when the street lights came on, which would be about 9 o'clock, that's when you were supposed to come home. Other than that, you better be home by 5 o'clock or so. And then a lot of times your mother would come out and holler for you. There was a lady had a cowbell she'd ring, and then somebody else had a horn. Mm -hmm. Different methods of us getting your kids to come in. That reminds me something that we're going to touch on, and most cities didn't have this. And I never knew why they did it so much, but let's talk about the 4.30 whistle and the 5 o'clock whistle. What, uh, what were those? I mean, why did they blow those every day, Don? Well, that was a steam-generated whistle that was blown at Y-12 for shift change. They had it at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., at 3 p.m., 4.30, and then uh, at 11 at night. New Year's Eve, they blow the whistle at New Year's Eve to celebrate the new year. And also you could hear, if you lived in Woodland, you could hear this ooga horn that sounded when they had a fire alarm, a fire alarm in Y-12, and it'd be a, like a long or short ooga, ooga, ooga. Uga, and that code would indicate where the fire was. And I remember when I first hired in out there in the desk drawer, it had one of those books, and it, you could look at it and you could see where each code related to what building. So that, and then came along 
the civil defense sirens at five o'clock. They blow those I to that's make the one sure I that they worked and the dogs would howl oh, and everybody yeah. knew it was time to go home because it was five o'clock. So that's some of the ways that we knew when we were supposed to be at home. Well, they had one right up there at Pine Valley and we'd be playing down there. And, and, uh, and I think the 430 whistle didn't last as long as the five or it wasn't as loud, I can't remember now, but but it was a, that's kind of unique. Most cities don't have that. They call that Hornet Y-12 Big Toot. Oh, did they? Yeah. I want you to touch on something else too, you know, Clinton and the surrounding, Harriman, Rockwood, all these cities around. Did a lot of people that worked at the plants, and especially Kingston, I guess, a lot of those probably worked at K-25, didn't they? Cause it's well, people within a 75 mile radius worked at, here at the facility, uh, as far as Crossville and uh, Sunbright. They had buses that went out mm -hmm. and picked these people up and brought them back in. And uh, so it was, uh, a well-established uh, population around the areas that the people worked here, um, which was good because yeah. there was no industry here at all whatsoever. Uh, Harriman Knitting Mills was the only industry they had. So really, economically, for East Tennessee and the Knoxville vicinity, it was big stuff for Oak Ridge to come here, wasn't it? It really helped. Uh, Tremendously, TVA, Oak Ridge, University of course, University First Tennessee. I mean, Alcoa maybe those areas. That's uh, that. This made a huge impact, didn't it? It did. Even though today a lot of people don't know anything about Oak Ridge, we've been out some different states, and they say where you're from, and I say Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Well, where is that? Close to Knoxville. I said, did you uh, ever know anything about the bombs they dropped on Japan? Yeah, I said, that's where it started in Oak Ridge. Yeah. Really? And uh, we're still a secret city, really. Well, every, every once in a while, Jeopardy will have a question on there. And some of them, I guess recently they had an Oak Ridge question. And of course, it was, it's pretty easy for somebody to answer it that grew up here. And, and yeah. Don, I want to talk about, of course, we're talking about uh, the Oak Ridge History Museum here. We're, we're down here right now, but we want to talk about another museum that has uh, opened recently out at the K-25 site. Talk about what they offer out there too. Well, the new K-25 museum is uh, illustrates the K-25 gas diffusion process. It's sort of a hands-on type museum. When I say that, you walk up and you push a button and someone that they interviewed, lady or man, tells about working in their, that environment or that might be somebody that was there uh, and had to leave their families or something of that nature. And they've got pieces of equipment that they've uh, saved. And uh, it, it just talks the story about K-25 and, and what it consisted of in its heyday. It was the largest building under one roof in the world at the time. It was over a mile around the building. They used to use bicycles in the building to get from one place to the other. Of course, now there's nothing out there. They've finally taken down the last, that tall centrifuge building that's on the ground. And I think another year or so, the whole area will be uh, demolished. Don, do they have any, uh, 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 do you think that there'll be another, maybe another, I was a car plant or what do you think that eventually will, will, will move in that spot? Do you think it will be utilized? Well, there's been uh, speculation. There is some companies that's down there now that's using some buildings on site. I'm not sure what, it, what they make or what they do, but that's the original plan for the K-25 Museum was that they would be, by the way, it's located above the fire department, which the city runs for a mm -hmm. subdivision on the other side of the river. And there was supposed to be an observation tower built so you could look down over the footprint of where the U stood and also a walking trail around the perimeter and with billboards to indicate the different type of processes that went on. Whether DOE funds it and never gets built, I'd, I'd have to see it to believe it. Matter of fact, this museum took a long number of years before finally it was built. Mm -hmm. And it was only open a few weeks before the virus came in right. and they had to shut it down. So it's, it's a nice put together museum, but 
without the observation tower where people can go out and look over that footprint, it's just like anything else. If you, it's just kind of hard to imagine without having that. We but, really don't know if it'll ever be utilized for other. We just don't know what's at this point. Well, the museum is free at this point. Oh, is it okay? Yeah, and um, I think they're going to charge a fee probably later on because they were like we were, uh, you know, uh, we just wanted to open it up and see what kind of response they had to the public, and it turned out to be good, and we decided if we're going to stay in business, we're going to charge something. So I'm not sure what their future is, um, but I hope they're able to keep it. We need the Oak Ridge History Museum, we need the K-25, the American Museum of Science and the Children's Museum. We need those to be here to open for the people that comes to see the, the Oak Ridge Manhattan National Park. Well, the Children's here. Museum too is uh, utilized heavy too. I know bus tours come in there, they bring kids from a lot of school systems in. So we have so much to offer in museums here, don't we really in Oak Ridge? We, we do, and uh, the Children's Museum is open right now on a limited uh, schedule. And of course they say that children's less apt to get the virus or even spread the virus, which is a good thing. We're going to see shortly because school's fixing to open sure. up. And I hope that's the case. I also noticed that to talk about uh, Paducah and Portsmouth, uh, I was up in Paducah about four or five years ago. Uh, that is now being taken down too. So obviously we have enough uranium stored that I guess we don't need to process anymore. Well, that's a whole different process and it's now, a matter of fact, that process is still secret. I interviewed a particular individual years ago and they had to scrutinize the interview to make sure that what he said wasn't classified, and it wasn't. Yeah. But uh, the process, the little holes that the barrier had in it is what's really secret. And now they're worried about this process getting in the wrong hands over in Iran and Iraq and those places, you know. But yes, all of that will be gone, and just like down here at uh, the K-25 site. All portion to Purdue would be gone. Well, Don, it's certainly been uh, great coming down to the Oak Ridge History Museum. You've got so much knowledge of what went on in Oak Ridge and uh, being, of course, kin to Mr. Westcott and being around it. You've done tours down here and everything. But I would certainly like to thank you for spending a little time with you and going over. And uh, I'm going to let you have the opportunity to uh, talk to the public and we'll close out here if you would. Well, the Oak Ridge History Museum uh, originally opened on Thursday and Friday from 10 <coughs> to 3 and on Saturday from uh, uh, 10 to 3 and on 10 to 2, I'm sorry, on Thursday and Fridays. Of course, we're closed because of the virus and we're solely uh, operated by volunteers. If anyone would like to be a volunteer to come down they can uh, call me at 865-483-6081 and we'll get you on the volunteer list. You do not have to know anything about Oak Ridge history, but it certainly helps. And we'll teach you. We need people at the front desk to welcome people coming in to the museum and just be uh, there when we need the, you know, volunteers. Um, the museum, you can find us at our museum uh, website, oakridgemuseum.com. And we're a little bit behind on posting things, but as soon as we get uh, the word that we're going to open, we'll have that on there. And our uh, tour Oak Ridge, the Vista Center, has been very helpful about helping us get the word out across the country. And uh, it's just been a really interesting project, which is still in the works. And the problem is, the young people of, of our society are not too interested in history much. And it's like anything else, it'll eventually start fading in the past. And the schools are not teaching much about Oak Ridge history, although I do understand that you're required now to teach something about local history uh, in the school curriculum. Hopefully in the future, maybe we can work with those teachers and help them generate a lesson plan about Oak Ridge history. So, as, as Don said, we were doing private tours. I was doing tours and a couple of other guys, uh, Mick Weist and, and, and David, um, I've 
forgot his last name. I'm sorry. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. It's part of the aging. Tell but anyway, uh, we would do tours uh, for people and also do step on bus tours. So hopefully, uh, and when we get through this virus that we can pick that up again and be able to let the world know about the Oak Ridge History Museum. Thank you again, Don. I've certainly enjoyed it and certainly enjoyed our friendship throughout the years. Folks, we hope you've enjoyed this show today at the Oak Ridge History Museum. And stay tuned right here on ACTV for some more great shows.